Good evening, everybody. Hi, y'all. <laughs> I bring greetings from Atlanta. Uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to introduce you to Confessions of a Radical Industrialist. That's the book that's just out, and some of you already have it, and others, I think, uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> uh, to our customers who are here tonight, I would not miss this opportunity to thank you for your business. Um, about the weather, there's a line in the book that goes like this, uh, when it rains in the desert, that's weather. But the desert is the desert because of climate. What I didn't deal with is when the rain washes the desert away. <laughs> I don't know what to call that, but global climate disruption. And here you are. You have it. Uh, I want to, uh, for a moment here, switch to a, a very serious personal note. Uh, at the risk of uh, creating an awkward moment, for which I apologize in advance, I wouldn't want you to hear a rumor tomorrow after having been here tonight uh, and my not having said anything about it. But I've been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, it was found almost accidentally during a, a routine examination and the doctors have probed everywhere, and it's in my liver. And the doctors have not yet found the, the primary source of it. So we're still looking for that. And uh, cancer seldom begins in the liver. It generally metastasizes to the liver from somewhere else. And it has metastasized to my liver, but nobody can find the somewhere else yet. So we're still on that case. I wanted you to know that so you didn't hear it tomorrow and wonder why the hell he didn't say something about it last night. Now then, on to what I had intended to say. I, I plan to sketch for you some key themes of the book, but I'm also going to, uh, to cross you up a bit by entitling these remarks The Corporation of the Future, Reinventing the Industrial System, for that is what the book is about. Two well-known quotes, one from 47 years ago. We stand now where two roads diverge, but unlike the roads in Robert Frost's familiar poem, they are not equally fair. The road we've long been traveling is deceptively easy, but at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the earth. Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, 1962. 25 years later, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present generation without sacrificing future generations' ability to meet their needs. The Brundtland Commission of the United Nations, 1987, 22 years ago, 23 years ago now. This evening, I hope to expand the meaning of those two quotes. And in so doing, I'm going to rely on the adage that form follows function. So there won't be anything here about, uh, about legal structure or organizational structure or governance issues. Uh, I won't be discussing them here, and I don't discuss them in the book. There's no attempt here to either to address the controversial issue of the personhood of a corporation or the mischief that that might have caused through the years. I do make one assumption that capitalism will continue to set the framework within which the corporation of the future will function, though I also suggest that capitalism is likely to have to adapt too. I'll concentrate these comments, as I do in the book, on corporations that make things, what they do and how they go about doing it, Furthermore, my focus is on the real economy and not its rough analog, the financial markets with their various indexes. In other words, my focus is on the industrial system of which we are each and every one a part. For this is where the greatest challenge lies to en environmental sustainability. Contemplating the corporation of the future, one immediately is prompted to ask what future 
That's not to suggest there won't be a future. It's rather to suggest that the future stretches far into, well, the future. So the real question is, what time horizon are we addressing when we say the future? Whether in the title of these remarks or in the Brundtland Commission's definition of sustainable development. Indeed, what time horizon was the Brundtland Commission contemplating when it proffered its definition? So let me frame the macro issue this way. We, individually and collectively, that is humankind, are an integral part of two very large interrelated, intimately coexisting global systems. Let us call one of these the technosphere. The other key component of the technosphere besides ourselves is this industrial system, the way we access raw materials, then make, transport, use, and discard things. Employing technologies across the full spectrum of technology from electrical to mechanical to petroleum to chemical, civil, architectural, aeronautical, and space, environmental, construction, mining, and metallurgical, textile, nuclear, agricultural, automotive, biotechnological, as well as electronic and semiconductor technologies. The, the technosphere, we and the industrial system, coexists with the second global system, the biosphere. The biosphere consists of all the natural systems, the living systems and the life support systems of the earth, the forests, the rivers, the oceans, the wetlands, the atmosphere, the ozone layer, the aquifers, the croplands, the grasslands, the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, climate regulation, pollination, seed dispersal, flood and insect control, etc., etc., and all of life on Earth, including us. So we have the technosphere and we have the biosphere, and we have the coexistence of these two within a thin spherical shell that is 8,000 miles in diameter, the diameter of the Earth, and about 10 miles thick, extending five miles into the, tro into the depths of the ocean and five miles into the troposphere. Notice that we humans are the common element in both spheres, and relatively speaking, the thin shell is the thickness of saran wrap on a basketball-sized earth. In this context, then, a good, perhaps better definition of sustainability might be the continued, healthy, balanced coexistence into the indefinite future of the technosphere and the biosphere within this thin shell. Another name for the biosphere, of course, is nature. Yet it's manifestly clear today that this coexistence is so unbalanced and so threatened that it is not healthy. Rachel Carson's Wrong Road. On a global scale, every living system is in decline. Biodiversity plummets. An extinction unprecedented in 65 million years is underway now. The human footprint increases. The planet's carrying capacity for humans shrinks. The planet warms. The climate is disrupted. The weather goes nuts. The technosphere continues to expand at nature's expense as the economy worships at the near sacred shrine of growth. The question arises, how can this go on and on and on and on into the indefinite future? And the answer is clearly it cannot unless we somehow miraculously find that the Earth is infinite in its ability to supply the stuff demanded by the technosphere and to absorb the poison produced by the technosphere. This imbalance, this disequilibrium, is a serious, serious problem, and we are creating for ourselves, our grandchildren, and their grandchildren, and beyond. So how do we begin to reverse the negative trends eliminate this problem and bring these two systems, technosphere and nature, into harmonious balance in a way that will last a thousand human generations, 10,000 human generations, that is to say, indefinitely. Let's be very clear. The longer we wait to get started in earnest, the greater will be the deficit that we and successive generations have to overcome. Therefore, I'm addressing a time horizon that extends from now through a period of urgent, enormous, and essential transformation 
to a state of global equilibrium between biosphere and technosphere in which the two will coexist in balance and harmony, meaning the technosphere will be taken from the biosphere no more than the biosphere can naturally and rapidly renew with energy input from the sun into the indefinite future. That is sustainability. So how does the technosphere, we in this industrial system of ours, move from its present state to that ideal end state of equilibrium and remain there into the indefinite future? Let's begin to answer that question by assessing where the industrial system is now. For starters, our society, especially its industrial system, and essentially every corporation on earth is in the iron grip of this equation. This is Paul and Ann Ehrlich's environmental impact equation, I equal P times A times T, from the Population Bomb, their book. The two of them, I believe, teach at Berkeley, even as we speak. In this equation, I stands for environmental impact, a negative term, the bigger, the worse. P stands for population, A for affluence, and T for technology, in its broadest sense, as I just enumerated a moment ago, this equation says that environmental impact or degradation is caused by people, the more the worse, what they consume in their affluence, the more the worse, and how all of that is produced, used, and disposed of, the more technology, the worse. So at the heart of this current and ongoing environmental decline is this take-make-waste industrial system, making and supplying the stuff that we humans consume in our affluence and discard in our thoughtlessness. And technology, T, is a major part of the problem. So are affluence, A, and population, P. And population is a subject for another day, and I, have, I make no effort to deal with it here or in the book. But I will get to affluence, A, before we finish. First, we must ask the question, though, what confines technology, T, to the numerator, where it contributes to the problem rather than to the solution? Why does T multiply negative impacts? I suggest that this is because T in the numerator accurately represents the technologies of the first industrial revolution. Call them T1. If I can make this work. Ah, wrong. Yes, there. T1. We've grown up with them. We take them for granted. Consequently, they're prevalent all through our society and its industrial system, and they share some common attributes. They are extractive. They take from the earth. They are linear, take, make, waste. Driven by energy from fossil fuels, wasteful, abusive, and focused on labor productivity, more of everything per man hour. So the Ehrlich equation could probably be modified to read I equal P times A times T1. I further suggest that the prevalence of T1 in our society arises out of a flawed view of reality that underlies the industrial system, a paradigm that traces its roots to the earliest days of the Industrial Revolution, the early 18th century, when people were the limiting factor of production and nature was bountiful, seemingly inexhaustible. It's a view of reality which assumes, or acts as if it assumes, that the earth is infinite and its ability to provide the stuff to feed the industrial system's metabolism, and infinite in its ability to, support the, to absorb the system's waste, no matter how much, no matter how poisonous. That relevant time frames for considering the consequences of our individual decisions are very short, almost never beyond our own lifetimes, more likely not beyond our working lives. In business, long-range planning is maybe five years. In politics, just the next election. That Earth was made for humans to conquer and rule. Homo sapiens don't really need those other species except for food and fiber and fuel and maybe shade on a hot summer day. That Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market is an honest broker. That business exists to make a profit, the Milton Friedman school of thought. That the route to abundance for all is through increasing labor productivity, more everything per man hour. It was natural enough to think this way in the 18th century when people were scarce and nature was bountiful. Why not use nature to enhance human productivity? It made perfect sense then 
300 years ago. The technology coupled with left-brain human intelligence, practical, pragmatic, numbers-driven results-oriented will see us through, though the iPad equation stands in defiant contravention of this assumption. I suggest that the view of reality represented by these beliefs is, de is deeply flawed and also underlies the flawed system of economics that begins by defining the basic economic problem as the gap between what we have and what we want, not need, want. The basic economic problem drives all of economic progress, so we are told by the economists. This is the first lesson of Economics 101, the gap between what we have and what we want. <clears throat> economists tell us that we can never close that gap, that whatever we have, we will always want more, and that that gap drives all economic prog progress. It's also a system that worships at the shrine of growth without due consideration for what should grow and what should not grow. It is a system that ignores the externalities, the cost of society and innocent third parties that are inherent in so many of the transactions that it fosters as it establishes prices solely on the basis of supply and demand without regard to true costs. And this, of course, renders the invisible hand blind as the bat in its allocation of resources as it stumbles along in its blindness, ignoring the consequences of its actions that are represented by the externalities it creates. When we stand back and look at the system and the mindset or the worldview that underlies it, we cannot avoid the inevitable conclusion. This system that takes from the earth whatever it wants to produce products that quickly end up in landfills and incinerators, think pollution, wastes vast amounts of resources all along the way and does all of this with total indifference to societal costs, simply cannot go on and on and on and on. <clears throat> we humans cannot build a truly long-range future on this economic model. Its days of necessity are numbered because the industrial system that stems from this worldview is destroying the biosphere that undergirds the system itself. For you tell me, what company, what economy, what civilization can survive without air, clean water, food, energy, materials, climate regulation, an ultraviolet radiation shield, pollination, seed dispersal, flood and insect control, water purification and distribution, the hydrologic cycle, nutrient cycling, the carbon cycle, including photosynthesis, and more, all provided by nature. Without any of these, there would be very little economy at all. Nature truly is the goose that lays all the golden eggs. And like the goose in Jack and the Beanstalk, nature is being squeezed to death. If this is a state in which we, the technosphere, the industrial system, and ourselves now find ourselves, where must we go from here? And how? For starters, we have to find a way to rewrite the Ehrlich impact equation, to break its iron grip by moving technology to the denominator. I equal P times A divided by T. Then technology would reduce environmental impact to become part of the solution instead of a major contributor to the problem. The mathematically minded will see it immediately. The bigger T becomes in the denominator, the smaller the environmental impacts become. But what must happen societally for such a transformation to occur? I suggest that the underlying mindset, the paradigm, the view of reality, the world view must change. The old flawed mindset born of the 18th century must be replaced by a new mindset that acknowledges the earth is finite as a source and as a sink. We can see it from space. That is it. There isn't any more. Relevant time frames for considering the consequences of our decision are evolutionary in scale. We must grow up as a species and learn to think beyond our individual lifetimes and our trivial self-interests. Humankind was made for Earth, not the other way around. The Earth doesn't belong to us, we belong to it. And the diversity and the vitality of nature are crucially important in keeping this whole web of life, including us, going sustainably over evolutionary time. 
The blind, invisible hand of the market is a dishonest, opportunistic broker. It will foist any cost on society that an unwary or uncaring public will allow it to. It must constantly be redressed to keep it honest and give it sight. Business exists to make a profit? I beg to differ. Business makes a profit to exist, not the other way around, and must surely exist for some higher purpose given its pervasive global reach and its power for good or evil. And what about technologies? Technologies that are extractive, linear, take, make, waste, driven by fossil fuels, wasteful, abusive, and focused on labor productivity, emanating from a flawed mindset, are inherently unsustainable. They do belong in the numerator where they multiply environmental degradation to move to the denominator and become part of the solution. Technologies themselves must evolve to become renewable, cyclical, driven by solar energy, waste-free, benign, and focused on resource productivity, the efficient use of all resources, not just labor. These define the technologies that move T from the numerator to the denominator, T2. This is the new test for the viability and suitability of technologies in a sustainable industrial system and in the cooperation of the future. Do you see how T2 technologies emulate nature, cyclical, renewable, solar-powered, waste-free? Don't you find that interesting? I do. These two technologies can also put people now no longer the scarce commodity, but also overly abundant, but now overly abundant, put those people to work in ways that conserve nature. That is now, that is now the, the scarce and diminishing resource here in the 21st century. For surely, surely the greatest moral, ethical, and practical challenge humankind and the economic and industrial systems face is lifting the poorest among us out of grinding poverty while simultaneously repairing an already badly damaged biosphere. Resource efficiency, the efficient use of all resources, is the route to abundance for all, for an indefinite future on a finite earth. As for intelligence, what about right brain intelligence, the subjective, the caring, the nurturing, the artistic side of intelligence? Perhaps it's a good bit more important, after all, than the left side, since it also represents the human spirit. Therefore, I would say to you, the ascendancy of women in business and in the professions and in government is one of the most encouraging of all trends, as women bring their right brain nurturing nature to bear on the seemingly intractable problems created by us left brain men. So... If society adopts this new mindset, how does it then shape the corporation of the future? Indeed, the industrial system of the future that will survive and thrive as an integral component of a technosphere that is in harmony and balance with the biosphere into the indefinite future. Well, that sounds downright utopian, doesn't it? Is it even possible? Well, the answer to the question, is it possible, is found at the micro level. And the answer is yes, it is possible. As Amory Lovins, found in chief scientist of the Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, often says, if something exists, it must be possible. I can quote Amory because as I speak here, <clears throat> I'm drawing from the real life experiences of my company, Interface Incorporated, an example of what is coming into existence, what is proving to be possible. As for how, the answer to the first question the interface experience is the result of a plan for achieving zero environmental impact, zero environmental footprint by the year 2020. This is a billion-dollar global corporation, petrochemically intensive corporation, for its energy and its materials. The plan is a plan for transforming this typical petro, typical, this, excuse me, petro-intensive company into the prototypical sustainable company of the 21st century. And I would suggest out of strong conviction that if Interface, given its petroleum intensive nature, can do it, any company can. And if any company can, it follows logically that every company can. That is to say, the entire industrial system can. So how did such a conviction originate? 
In 1994, inspired by Paul Hawkins' treatise, The Ecology of Commerce, and driven by a guy named John Picard who said, interface just doesn't get it, and he's sitting right down here, I committed Interface, the company I founded in 1973 to produce carpet tiles in America for the emerging office of the future. I committed this company to the path to sustainability and to the plan for achieving it. Fifteen years ago, despite the enormous challenge inherent in such an ambitious commitment, we began at Interface where every company must begin, where we were. As part of a supply chain that took materials from and energy and materials, both fossil derived from the earth, produced our products in linear take, make, waste processes, sold those products into a marketplace where they served their purpose typically for 10 to 20 years and thence were relegated to landfills or incinerators long since forgotten by us, their maker. We first created a schematic showing the linkages of our company to the earth its biosphere and its lithosphere through our suppliers, our customers, communities in which we operate and directly through our own people, processes, and products. I won't bore you with the details of the schematic, but then we ask ourselves, what is wrong with this picture? We ask this question when very few of any companies anywhere were asking such a question of themselves, and out of that question came the plan for realizing a new vision of our company to climb a very high mountain, clear to the top, Mount Sustainability. The point at the top symbolizing zero environmental impact. We call this mountain Mount Sustainability and believe me, believe you me, it's higher than Everest. The challenge is hugely daunting. The commitment to reach the summit must be equally unrelenting and unfaltering. The goal to operate our petro-intensive company so as to take from the earth only what the earth can naturally and rapidly renew with energy input from the sun and to do no harm to the biosphere. As we studied this mountain for fully a year, we identified seven faces of Mount Sustainability and we set out to climb each face to its own peak to meet at the summit, which symbolizes zero footprint, zero impact with the target year 2020. We call this in a face Mission Zero. The first, the first face of the mountain is the elimination of waste. Even the very concept of waste, emulating nature in our industrial processes. In nature, there's no waste. One organism's waste is another's food. The cost avoided by this effort through 2009 mid-year, cumulatively $419 million saved. And this has funded the entire mountain climb, rendering sustainability at interface self-funding. The second face of the mountain is the one of emissions to ensure totally benign emissions, working upstream with suppliers to establish those screens that eliminate all the harmful materials. So whatever comes into our factories will go out as product or as solid waste or as liquid effluent or gaseous emissions. We want to operate factories that don't need smokestacks and don't need effluent pipes. And for sure, we want to operate factories that don't produce toxics or greenhouse gases that contribute to climate disruption. The third phase of the mountain is to operate on 100% renewable energy, concentrating on energy efficiency first to drive energy usage to its irreducible minimum and then harnessing renewable sources of energy and creating verifiable offsets to eliminate or neutralize our greenhouse gas contribution to global climate disruption. The fourth face of the mountain is to close the loop on material flows, to capture those precious energy-intensive hydrocarbon molecules after their first product life and give them life after life in cyclical flows. No more linear take-make-waste processes, with the cyclical processes themselves also driven by renewable energy. The technologies did not exist 15 years ago, but now they fall into place one by one. As you can perhaps imagine, this is not a flavor of the month exercise. It is a commitment of a lifetime. The fifth face of the mountain is to transport people and products in climate neutral, resource efficient, pollution free modes. Perhaps most important of all is face number six. This is sensitizing 
all stakeholders. This is the culture shift. This is changing the mindset that underlies our own production system and not just the mindset of our own people, but of suppliers and customers and even the communities where we operate. Without such a shift in mindset, to no lasting change will occur. As Albert Einstein told us, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used to create them. Vitally necessary new thinking comes only out of a new mindset. Overcoming the status quo, we've always done it this way, is hard, but it is essential. It does not happen without a willingness to risk failure, but to learn from failure and try again. The seventh face of the mountain calls for the redesign of commerce itself. In a new economy, an economy that seeks to satisfy needs rather than wants, internalizes the externalities into prices, gets the prices right, and creates an honest, sighted market. For many industrial companies like Interface, this will eventually translate into going to market with the services that our products provide rather than with the products themselves. Treating the products as means to an end, the end being satisfactory service delivered. For Interface, this translates into selling the color, the texture, the design, the comfort underfoot, the acoustical value, the cleanliness, the ambiance, the functionality, satisfying all the reasons for which anyone would want our products in the first place, while retaining ownership in the means of delivery. I can tell you parenthetically, a chapter in in Confessions, a chapter is devoted to each of those seven faces of the mountain and also to the eighth face, which you'll have to read the book to find out about. <clears throat> the chapters in the book talk about how we actually do what I've just described. Success on all seven faces will bring us to an entirely new schematic. Again, I'll spare you the tedium of the schematic, but... You know, how is our real-life example doing? How far have we come in 15 and a half years on this 26-year-long journey? Maybe the following ecometrics for mid-year 2009 will help you understand that. I don't know whether you can read it or not in the back, but the first line says 83% reduction in landfill waste per unit of production since 1996. Water intake down 83% per unit of production since 1996. Total energy down 41% per unit of production since 1996. With a changing of energy mix to include renewables, fossil fuel intensity reduced by 55%. With verified offsets added, net greenhouse gases reduced 95%. We're pretty sure we'll finish the year with that figure above 90 percent, which translates into a greenhouse gas intensity of around 95 percent, given the growth in the company. And this, by the way, is the magnitude that, of the change that the entire global technosphere must realize by 2050 to avoid catastrophic climate change. So we're being told by our best scientists. 30 percent of Global energy is from renewable sources and increasing rapidly. 35% of raw materials by weight is recycled or bio-based materials and increasing rapidly. 100% renewable electricity in our European factories, 89% worldwide. 96 million square yards of climate-neutral carpet produced since 2003. Climate-neutral from the wellhead to end-of-life reclamation. We call it cool carpet. 93,000 tons of product reclaimed and, re, and, and, and brought back to the factory to be, to be recycled in closed loops. The reverse logistics are dawning, but they are, they are happening. And the closed loop, life after life, material flows are also happening. 196 million airline passenger miles offset by some 100,000 trees planted. An overall footprint reduction, if you take the apples, oranges, peaches, and tomatoes, sort of, is somewhere around 60%. We're about 60% of the way there in terms of time and 60% of the way there in terms of progress. The cumulative avoided waste costs, as I said earlier, totaling $419 million, have paid 
for this entire transformation, waste elimination paying for the mountain climb. And in case you're wondering, can a company do this and not go broke? Sales over the same period of time increased 60% and profits doubled. As I said, I think earlier, if we can do it, anybody can with your help because you, the people, and you represent the people at large, are the absolute key to this. The power is with the people in the marketplace asking for the products that are less unsustainable. So, let me lay out the business case for you in case uh, you're wondering what that might be. Costs are down, not up. Dispelling that myth, the false choice between the environment and the economy. Our products are the best they've ever been. Sustainable design is a wellspring of innovation, especially biomimicry, looking to nature for inspiration. How would nature do this? It was that very question that produced two of our most revolutionary products in the company's history. Third, our people are galvanized around this shared higher purpose. Maslow said it a long time ago, at the top of the pyramid of human needs is this need for self-actualization, which translates into being associated with something bigger than ourselves. And fourthly, the goodwill of the marketplace is greater than any amount of advertising, no matter how clever, no matter how creative, any amount of marketing, no matter at what cost, could possibly have created. And believe me, we know it's earned every day by doing, not by talking. It is a better way, a better way to bigger, more legitimate profits, a better business model. It's better for the planet, and it's better for the shareholder. <clears throat> but coming back to the, to the macro case, what about that sacred shrine of growth? Moving toward a sustainable society, what should grow and what should not grow? Here are some thoughts to stimulate your own thinking. The lowest impact technologies, those that belong in the denominator, should grow. Those that belong in the numerator, the abusive ones, should shrink and eventually disappear. The sale of services should grow. The sale of products should shrink. Applied brain power should grow. Applied brute force should shrink. Market shares for sustainable companies should grow. For the unsustainable companies, market shares should shrink to zero. At best, however, <clears throat> humanity faces a period of transition in which the equation will read I equal P times A times T1 divided by T2, where T1 represents the unsustainable technologies and T2 represents the sustainable technologies. But over time, T1 must give way to T2 and eventually only T2 is left. But can humanity realize a sustainable society even if the entire industrial system eventually operates within the revised Ehrlich equation I equal P times A divided by T2? I actually think not. For affluence is still represented by a capital A suggesting that affluence is an end in itself, perhaps the end. This just seems entirely too consistent with the old definition of the basic economic problem, the gap between what we have and what we want. What if, however, Homo sapiens matured as a species to the point that the basic economic problem were redefined as the gap between what we have and what we need? And what if that resulted from a reordering of priorities for individuals and society so that affluence could be represented by a lowercase a, suggesting that it is a means to an end rather than an end or the end in itself? <clears throat> and what if the, the true end we all seek, happiness, were injected into a further revised early equation? It would then read P times little a, divided by T2 times capital H for happiness. More happiness, less stuff. Is that a pretty good idea? Yeah. That would not only redefine the industrial system, it would redefine civilization itself, as well as capitalism. 
and would open up the real possibility for all human needs to be met through fair and efficient use of all resources. Meeting the challenge to lift the four billion poorest among us out of grinding poverty while healing the already damaged biosphere. But can the corporation of the future that I have described survive and thrive among such a reoriented set of societal priorities? Well, I suggest that only the corporation of the future, as I have described it, organized to meet needs sustainably, can survive in such a reordered world into an indefinite future. The typical corporation of the present will be the proverbial fish out of water and will surely suffer the same fate as that unfortunate fish. Environmental impacts must become vanishingly small if humans, even seven generations from now, much less 10,000 generations from now, are to be born into a livable world. Yet one might ask, <clears throat> isn't there a chicken and an egg problem here? Will a transformed society drive the transformation of the industrial system, or will a transformed industrial system drive the transformation of society? And the answer is yes and yes. For the critical breakthrough mutation has already occurred. The chicken, the new species of company, is being born right now. So the two, society and its new industrial system, can co-evolve to a higher plane where equilibrium between technosphere and biosphere is achieved at last. This, I believe, will create the foundation of a new world order, as well as a sustainable, livable future for all generations to come. The last major variable, population P, remains, but actually may not be as independent a variable as it seems in the equation. The forces that give rise to modified affluence and greater happiness, in particular the education of women around the world, may very well influence population to a lower peak level than the current United Nations projection of 9.5 billion people. But as I said at the beginning, that's a discussion for another day. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.